All right, so like I mentioned in the last video, I did not set up any of the actual sensors that you're supposed to set up. And I'm gonna do that here. So what we kind of set up, uh, or at least have the, what am I trying to say? The, the backbone for ready to set up the sensors. We have an EL out, which is an element out, which is going to give us the strain and stress response of a certain element that that we want. So whatever element we want, or we can set a bunch of elements. We'll get into that. And then we also have a node out, which is just going to give us kinematics of a certain node. And I'm going to try different nodes and show you what the difference is if, wherever you put them. And we also, uh, RC force is automatically going to give us whatever the contact force is of all of the contacts in this model. But we're going to define something a little more um, specific. It's called SEC force. And this is the section force. So what you can do is define a th section through a solid and actually get the force from that part. And it's a little less noisy than using the contact force. And it's a little more representative of an actual load cell, if that makes any sense. So like if you actually had a load cell at the bottom of this plate, it would be like a little block or a, or a cylinder. And then you'd actually pull the, the load from that. And that's kind of what a section force is representing. So um, we'll start by defining a, the easiest one would be node out for now. So we'll start by defining the node out. So what do you do? Well, you first have to go into keyword and then your database here. So you're gonna have to hit all because it's not showing everything. What you wanna do is go to, sorry, you wanna go to database and then you wanna go to history node so scroll down to history node. And what this is going to do is tell LS Dyna that you're going to take all of the kinematics for this node and save them so that you can look at them later. And that's what the database ASCII option is doing is it's saying we want the nodes to be saved out for whatever is saved here under history node. So I um, hope that makes sense. And there's a few options you can do you can save out a single node. So if you click this, you're actually able to click like, these are all different IDs for nodes. So you can say node one, node two, you can go through and just do whatever you want. Um, you can also go into no history node ID, and this is where you do one at a time. This is what I would recommend most of the time if you have a single node that you're trying to track, like a CG of a head or um, the CG of the ball where you say like, node one and then you can give it a name so you can say like ball cg which means like center of gravity so center of gravity or something like that and then you'd hit insert and then accept and it would save that you can also go to node local this is gonna be a little more complicated because you have to define a local coordinate system to use these so i won't get into this right now but just know that it's gonna save the kinematics and stuff of that node relative to a local um, coordinate system. Hope that makes sense. And then you have uh, history node sets. So this is where you can actually define a, uh, a set in here and create entity. So a set of nodes, and then you can save out all of the kinematics of that set of nodes and then retrieve it. So that could be useful if you wanted to take you can make a node set of all of the nodes in this ball and then include it here and then you can retrieve that and average all of the nodes to get like an averaged kinematic of the ball so um, these are all the different ways you can do this so for now what i'm gonna do i'm gonna make a few history node ids just to show you the difference and we're mainly gonna be looking at the ball so we're gonna do a few different node locations on the ball so this is like the center on the side. So what we're going to do is, I think you can point and click. You cannot point and click. So um, before you click, well, you can't click them when you're in this. So what you want to do is find the IDs for each of these. So what I usually do is go to element tool, identify, make sure you're on node. And then you can click the ones that you want to identify or that you want to include in the history node beforehand. So we want that one. And then we also want this one and let's do, hmm, we can do one in the dead middle too. So let me go ahead and put these two in and then I'll blank this so I can get to the middle. 
So history node ID. So we'll start by just typing these out. So one, three, six, six, two. We can call this ball top and then insert. And then we can call one, one, five, eight, five, six, one, five, eight, five, six. And this is ball side. insert and then uh, so now we have those two we can hit accept and done and I'm doing this because I want to blank this down the middle and select a node right in the middle of the ball if that makes sense so you go here to element tool to blank and hit by area I'm just gonna click I'm gonna drag right there and I'm gonna click this node right here like that Go back into history node ID, and this is nine nine two seven, and this is ball center, and then accept. Oh, so you have to hit in insert. Uh, so Got to do that again. Nine nine two seven, center, insert. All right, and then accept. So um, now we have these three different sensors to track the kinematics of the ball. Um, and this is using just actual nodes on the ball. There's another way you can do this by interpolating a node in the center of all the nodes on the outside. So I'm going to go ahead and do that too. Um, this is what you'd normally do if you have an object and you want to track the center of it. So this is what you do in real life. Um, if you want to track this ball, you could either put a marker on it, like on the outside and track it like with a camera. And when you track that, you're then going to find the center of it by, you know, d doing some math equations to interpolate that ball to the center of the ball using a math equation so that you know where the center is going. So that's what you do in real life. And we're going to kind of do that through a simulation. This is a little more straightforward than doing math equations because you don't have to do that. All right, so what we want to do is create a node in the center of this ball, so the center of its mass, and then we're going to constrain that node to the outside nodes of the ball just um, so that that node is what we're going to follow. We're not just going to follow a node on the ball that can deform. We're going to follow one that's constrained to the outer constraints. A lot of constraints going on. So what you first want to do is measure where the center of gravity of the ball lies so that you can create a node at that point. So what you want to do is isolate the ball only. Isolate. Why is it not doing it? Okay. Okay, there we go. Um, and then you're going to go to element tool, measure. And then up here, you're going to click this down box and go to inertia. And you're going to click this check mark active elements only this is the main way you do this it's just kind of a roundabout way and i always do all because this is the only thing active and then you're going to hit apply and down here it's going to show these things and you can double click this area and it's going to bring up this um, box and this is recording everything that you do in pre-post and what you see here is you got your mass and you have the cg or center of gravity and it's these locations here so what i would normally do is I just copy this so I can click and just do control C and just copy it. I'm going to close that, hit done. Then I'm going to go to node edit, create, and then um, by position, yes. And we're going to go, we're going to make a, a number for this node. So let's just call it you don't want to overwrite anything so new id is this let's make it something kind of even so let's make it twenty thousand. and i'm just going to copy and or just paste in here what the coordinates were and so this was z so 230 was z so i'm going to control x that and cut it and paste and then y was 100 and then x was 100. It's kind of a weird way to do it. You can also just like screenshot it, move it to the side, and then paste the, or type in the values here. So then you're gonna hit create, 
and it should create that node. Yeah, there you can see it. It's that gray dot because it's not referenced by anything yet. And then hit accept, and there it is. So it's unreferenced, so it's this black dot, and you can click this button, and it's gonna hide unreferenced nodes, or you can click it on, and it's gonna show it. And if you can't find it when you create it, it's probably because this isn't checked. So now we know that node was 20,000. So what we're gonna do is do a thing called constraint interpolation. We're gonna constrain that node to the outside edges of the ball. So what we first wanna do is create a node set on the outside of the ball. So just this outer surface, all of those nodes. And then we're gonna take that node that we just created and constrain it to that node set. So in order to create that node set, uh oh, I got sneeze. All right, so um, in order to create this node set, you're gonna to go to create entity up here in model. And then you're gonna to go to set node. Um, and then what we're gonna do is create a new set and we're only gonna make it the outer surface of the ball. So we already made a set and it's all over the ball. So it's every node in this ball. Um, and you can click it and see it's all of the nodes. Um, we're gonna do create new, we can name it two, that's fine. And we'll call this ball outer. And then what we wanna do is go to, let me first deselect this. So it's not confusing, ball outer. Then we're gonna go to by element propagation, and then we can make this like 20. Um, I've gone over this, but this is just propagating the selection along this angle on the surface. So it's gonna select every node that is connected by an angle of an element that is less than 20 here, and you can change this. So the higher this value is, the more nodes it'll select. And this is just a continuous ball, so it really doesn't matter. You can make this as big as you want. It's just going to select the surface. So now we're going to hit, uh, hit right now we're going to hit apply. And then there's the new node set that we created. So then you can hit done here. And then what we're going to do is go into keyword. And we're actually going to create this interpolation. So it's in constrained. And then interpolation, which is before J. There it is. Just gonna double click that. And then you're gonna have these options here. And I'll move this to the side. So this, uh, this first option is the interpolation um, constraint ID. So this is just the ID for this constraint. This doesn't really matter. You can just make this one. This is the dependent node ID. So this is that 20,000 that we made in the center of the ball. And then um, this is a local coordinate system. If you, ha if you have that option, don't worry about it. Um, and then here's the option for what this node is going to be constrained to. You can make it a node or a node set. So what we want to do is make this one. And then here is where you select that node set. So you're going to click this circle and then click ball outer and then done. And so now what we have is uh, node ID 20,000, that new one that we created. It's going to be constrained to the node set two, which we just created, which are these highlighted nodes. And then what you got to do is hit insert and then accept. And now that we've constrained that node to these, um, this node set out here, you know, done. And what we can do is go to display, hide these, these node sets, and you can go to constrained, and then interpolation, and then, why is it showing a bunch of constrained interpolations? Oh, there we go, it, it just kind of glitched out. Um, and then one, and then here you see, um, it's constraining this node that you can't really see because there's so many lines. Constraining that to all of the nodes on the outside of the ball. So it looks like it's working. You can hide that and then there we go. So now what we need to do is add that node that is constrained. So node ID 20,000, add that to a um, history node, which we already created for the outside of the ball. So you're gonna go to database, history node ID, and what we're going to do is make it one, 20, one, two, three. And we'll call this ball center interp and then insert. And then there's that new one. So now we have these four different sensors on the ball. We have the one on the top, which is up here, the one on the side, which is over here and the center, which is actually on the mesh of the ball. And then in the center, which is interpolated from the edges. And we're gonna see just how different all of these are. So hit accept and then done. So now we have our kinematics of the ball set up 
and what we want to do now is do a section force. So that's the next part. Um, it's probably the next easiest one to set up. So you're going to get database, ASCII option, and um, so we've already set it up. It's here, section force. So what you need for a section force are two things. You need a solid set, so a set of solid elements, and a attached set of nodes. Um, and I'll show you that in a sec. So you're going to go to create entity and we'll first create a solid set. So we're gonna make two of these. We're gonna make one for the block and then one for the ball. And so we're gonna to go to set solid and then create and then we can leave it at one and call it block. And then what you're gonna do is go to by element area and then you're just gonna click and drag. I'm just gonna select the ones in the middle and you're just going to select something like that. And you can hold control and make sure that you only selected those. And it looks like, looks like we did. So apply. And we're also going to make one of these in the ball. So you can select either this one or this one or anywhere really, but wherever it's like a clean line. So uh, we'll call this one ball and I'll just select this one. So as you can see, we selected more than we actually intended to. Um, so if you want to fix that, there's a few ways. You can try and just click off of them through the ball. So you can like right click and drag. And you got most of them, but you're not going to be able to get all of them because this isn't like a clean line. So what you can do is just hit apply for now and then hit done. And then a trick you can do is go to element tool, blank, and what you're going to do is go to buy set. Um, but before you do that, you're going to make sure this is on element, this is on solid, and then you're going to go by set. <clears throat> Man. And then you're going to go to, see, it's glitching out. Sometimes it'll do this ball. So it's going to blank those elements. And then what we're going to do is hit reverse, and it's going to isolate them. So um, what we can then do is manually go through and we can get it done here, click, go to pick and we can click off of all of these. That may take a while. So another option is to, you can probably use propagate and 45 click, there you go. Handy tool. And now we have these isolated and these are the only ones we want in the segment or the solid set, sorry. So you can hit done. Mo uh, model back to create entity and now what we're going to do is modify this and I don't know why it's glitching out but this is the one we have and we're going to want to show this one and then go to modify and we're going to click that and we're going to hit clear we're going to apply because we're just going to get rid of it and then we're just going to re-select it so we only want these and then hit apply so there we go so now we have uh, both solid sets, and we also want to unblank everything. So go back to blank, unblank all, and there we go. Now we want to create two node sets that are attached to these. So we're going to create a node set right along this mid plane, and then a node set on this other one, which is it's so bizarre. One here. So we're going to go to model, create entity, set node. And then we're going to want to create, sorry, so set node, we can leave it at three and we'll call this block load cell and go to area. And then you want to make sure that you select only nodes on one side like that. And you can check it. Looks good. And then apply. And then you're going to go make another one. So four and we'll call this ball load cell. And we're going to go like that. Oh, that was a little more tricky. And I'm right clicking. I'm going to deselect those. There you go. So you always want to make sure you're selecting what you think you're selecting. And you know what? This is probably just really close. So I'm just going to redo this and go a little more accurate. There you go. And then apply. Perfect. So now we have our load cell um, with our solid set here, solid set here, and our node sets attached to them. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go to model, keyword, 
database and then cross section set it's right here you can double click that and we're gonna make two of these because we're gonna have two different load cells so this is actually what section force is gonna look for what um, the ASCII section force is gonna look for is this so we're gonna make one we're gonna call this one and we'll say block load cell and our node set is this one and it was block load cell three okay and then here's the solid element set you're gonna click that block done and then that's it so you have these two and you're gonna hit accept and now we're gonna make a new one so two and we'll call this ball load cell and the node set is going to be four and then we're going to make this the ball one that we created and then hit accept so now we have our kinematics ready with the ball and we have our four sensors ready with the ball and the block so the last output that we're going to set up is this el out one and in order to do that you're just going to need some database history element cards so similar to the the node out and how we do how we're going to do it but this is going to allow us to get strain and stress out of different elements that we pick so what we're going to do is go to database history go back to all so you can see everything um, so history and solid because we're going to do it out of the solids and solid and what you can do is you can do either sets or solid ids so what i'm going to do is both so we're mainly interested in this block so i'm only really going to work here and not eh, we'll do the ball too so i'll do two solid ids and one solid set on this um so for the solid id let's go ahead and do the same thing that we had to do with the nodes and we're going to have to identify different solids that we want to take the data from so hit the x and what we're going to do is go to identify and then element and then solid and what I'm just going to do is find an element pretty much directly under the blast zone. So around here. So I'm going to get rid of the ball. So like one of these. And you can do all four if you want. That's fine. But um, I'm just going to do one just to show you how it works. So you can click there. So that's solid 7811. And then we're going to pick one on the ball. And do something similar so around the bottom so that's one four nine five six okay and then um, we'll add those to our history solid ID zoom in so this one is seven nine one one this will be block top we hit insert you don't want to do a new id i guess you don't have to do that but all oh, bottom and insert and then hit accept so then these two are now going to be tracked oh it only picked the shell see this is why you always check so um, this is only selecting the shell of this actually, which is interesting because I hit identify element solid um, just to make sure it's going to select what we want it to select. I'm going to click here in blank so I can see if it's actually selecting this and it's not. So I don't know why. Um, so if we go back to identify element solid okay so it's just not it, it is identifying it um, sometimes when you hi highlight like this it'll show um, like a highlighted portion that is three three G what am I trying to say not three geometrical three dimensional um, but it's only shown it as a shell but it's still selecting the ID of that solid so it's just a little confusing for me because I'm not used to this but it's still the correct IDs. So when you go back um, here, okay, we accepted it, so it's already in there. So that's fine. And the last thing we're going to do is we're going to use the sets that we added for the 
block and the ball for that force gauge sensor. We're going to use those sets here for both the, um, the block and the ball and get the strain and stress out of those as well. Um, so the sets. So you can hit here and go to block, done, and here, ball. And it's important to know that whenever you click these circles, this is going to link things that have been made relevant to this. So set solids. So set shells or set nodes would not show up here. I can't explain why these have been created. Sometimes prepost just does weird things and it's all dependent on the version, but regardless. So you have both your sets that we added here and we'll hit insert and accept and done. So that's about it. Now all you want to do is save out what we've made and unblank what you've blanked. And I've already done that, but go up here to blank and then unblank all and then make sure everything's activated. So go to select part, hit all. And then we're going to go to, I'll do two things. You're going to go to save as project as this is going to allow you to just open it up directly and I've already made one, but we'll just override it there. Save. Yes. So then you can just like drag that project into prepost and it's going to open up exactly like it is right here. It's a quick, easy way to do it without worrying about like keyword changes. And the other thing is saving the whole, uh, project or not project model. I'm gonna go to save as save keyword as, and then, um, just going to call it whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> and um, go to advanced and make sure this is on expert. It's just going to format it a certain way that's going to be easier to read. Doesn't mean you're an expert. It's okay. So um, this is going to save the entire model. It's a pretty easy model, so I don't mind doing this. And then um, make sure I did that and then hit save. So now we're ready to run it and I can show some differences between the outputs that we made and how we made them. So I'll do that. All right. So the model's now been run and here's the output folder I put it in. So here's the model and then I just put all the outputs in this output folder. And so to open it, you're just going to open up prepost and then you're going to drag in this first D3 plot um, file right here and you're just going to drag it on the window and it's going to open it. So now you can uh, click the play button on this window. And it's going to play the, uh, the animation. And I think I went over this on the last video. But to open up the outputs, you're going to go to post, bin out, load. And then you're going to have this one bin out file. And this is that option I mentioned before. So you're going to double click that. And then you're going to click this file here. And now you'll have the option to select the different types of outputs that we've set up. And the ones that we're going to focus on right now are the... I guess we'll call them active ones or specific ones. And these are the EL out, which are the element outs, the node out, which are the different node kinematics and whatnot, and the section forces. And so we'll start with the element outputs. And I've kind of opened this to look at it. And you're going to click the solid there. And I usually drag this window down a little bit, and then you can see this bar. So once you click solid, you're going to have all of these pop, pop up. And these are all of the different elements that were put into the EL out output. So think of the different nodes and elements that we set up to get data out of. Those are the sensors and these overarching kind of output types are like the basket of sensors, if that makes sense. So you have like these buckets or baskets of a certain type of thing like kinematics or force data. And then you have the actual sensors here. So I initially set this up thinking that if you created a set and included it in the database output, so um, here is the K file, and I can kind of show you. Uh, let me open that again. So if you double-click the model file here, you're going to see, like, the text, how it's all showed up. And you can go down to the database history solid ID here. So we initially set up these two... Um, solid elements that we're going to look for and this one is the block on the top which is right below this ball and this one is the bottom of the ball which is right where the impact of the block is going to happen and usually when you do history whatever and then id 
it's going to show up in here with this name, but for some reason it didn't do it this time. And we also set up this database history solid set where we had both solid set one and two included here. And it didn't include them as sets. Instead, it took all of the elements that were included in this set and outputted the, the data from it. So this isn't really the the way I thought it was going to happen, but I'm going to show anyways how you can get data out of it. Generally, you don't really use, you don't really look at stress and strain in this type of function. You'd normally look for it in like a beam or something or a bone. You'd look at like what the different strains of the surface of the bone are and looking if it's, if it's going to fracture, if it breaks a threshold. So what you can do is output all of the nodes or not all of the nodes, all of the elements and then do like a processing script where you look at how many of those elements go above a certain strain threshold, that type of thing. So it's more of like a large scale analysis. But for now, what I'll show is um, I'll just kind of section off these from the sets that we have. So I know that block top is 7911, and I can assume that 40 to 7911 is going to be all on the top block. So if you scroll down and it looks like there's a jump like right. So this is what I mean. It's not really super practical. Okay. So here's 7911. This is the one that we picked. And if you did it highlight that. So 7911 is there, but it actually said we made it as the top of the block. It was supposed to be there. So now I'm kind of confused. I'm gonna look into it, but if you click one of these elements and you hit, um, or you're not gonna hit anything, you're gonna go down here and you're gonna click what you want to output. So here's stress strain, and these are specific. So we'll, we'll stick with stress and you can scroll down. These are different types of uh, stresses. You can kind of Google this in uh, the Dynaman or not the manager, the Dyna manual and get all the details on this. This is just the components of stress for these elements. So um, if you're an engineer, you kind of know what these are. They're like shear directions. But what I'm going to look at to start is the max principal stress. And this is typically, typically what's talked about when you look at like uh, bending of like a beam or something. You know, you're looking at max principal stress. So here, and you can hit plot, and it's going to plot this element throughout time. And what you kind of see um, here is this like oscillating effect. And I was kind of confused at what that was. And then I realized that the actual impact is fairly short. And if you go here and you click this, it'll allow you to actually like drag this and see like what's happening. But the actual impact is pretty short and it stops around right there. There's like the final unloading. So it's like 10 milliseconds, but then the rest of it is the ball flying upwards and the block doing this reverb. And that reverb is captured here in this um, this stress plot. This is stress versus time. And so if we're really looking at the max stress of this point, we're really going to focus here from 10 milliseconds lower. What you can do is hold control, click, and then drag to really like narrow it down. So if you're kind of wanting to look at what the stress encountered by this element during this impact is, this is what you look at right here. You really don't care too much about what's happening afterwards. I guess in certain cir circumstances you may, but um, this is what you're looking at. So you have like a max stress. If you left click and click on the curve, it'll tell you the, the X and then the max, like the Y of this point. So the max stress of this point is 7.5 e negative 5 gigapascals. So we're in gigapascals, so this is pretty, this seems low, but it's, you know, you got to convert it down to like kill kilopascals or megapascals. So um, there's an example of how to do it. So if you have a set of these or a bunch of them, you can click one and then hold shift and click the other. And you're going to see it's going to kind of load through all these and highlight them. And it may crash. It did not. And there is the set we made. And that was kind of a lucky intuition where I kind of stopped at a certain point. So if you want to plot all of these, you can just highlight them all, click what you want to plot and hit plot. And it may take a sec. And there we go. So 
This is a the same plot I just did before, but it's with all of these different elements. And this doesn't say too much. What you can do is you can actually output all of this using save, and then you can do single axis because you don't want to output the time for each one of these curves. And then you can save this out and then bring it into like MATLAB or Python or something. And you can actually filter out like this curve, which is the highest stress encounter to see where it's at. That may yield something that's of interest in your study, or you can look down here, whatnot. Um, you can also average all of these. So if you go down here to operation and you go to average, and then you're gonna hit apply, and it's gonna average all those curves. And then again, you can kind of cut it down here. This is mainly what you're looking at. And here is your max average of this section, if that's if that makes sense. So there's that. Um, if we want, we can compare the max stress of this block. So we can do snipping tool with that. And we just make a snip of that. And then we'll plot the cross section of the ball and compare the two. So then what we can do is we can go down here, click this. This is like the lowest point, and then we're going to go up to 7,000. Can't quite remember what the final number was. 9 1. So we're going to go to here. And then if I look what the ball um, point that we're looking at, it's 14956. So we're going to remove that because that's like an isolated point at the bottom of the ball, not part of the section. And it's right here. So so, and it's going to load back through all of these again. This stuff just takes a while. Um, so now if you go up here and you'll see, and you can hold control and see through all the things that you selected. So you can still do this. It's just a little more difficult to um, kind of capture what you want to look at if you actually have like a, a section um, that you're trying to look at all the, the stresses or the strains. So... Um, what you can do, or we're going to plot this and then average them all again and see what the difference between the section of the ball and the section of the block in terms of max principal strain averaged is. So they've plotted, and I keep plotting on this side for some reason. So here is this. You have a much larger distribution of, you know, what's the highest points. So what you can actually do is if you click here, um, you can, oh man, this thing is struggling. You can go to title, I believe, and then click legend. And then it'll show you, um, you know, a legend of this. When you have this many points, it's not super helpful. Um, there's a way, I don't know off the top of my head right now, I don't like want to just search for it while recording, but there's a way you can click and find what that element is just ask me a comment or maybe i'll just comment whenever i find it because that's useful um because this isn't super useful i understand um but if we want to get the average again and we'll compare we'll just hit apply so now we have this is for the ball and this was for the block so um as you can see the stress for the ball was much higher and this makes sense because the ball is stiffer, so it's inherently stiffer than the block. But if we plotted strain, you'd see that the strain of the block is much higher than the strain of the ball because the block's much softer and it's going to form much more. So um, you can go down here and go to strain if you want. Or actually what we'll do, we'll go ahead and clear out these and we'll only look at the two that we isolated to start this. So I'm not going to skip this because just this would be useful for somebody who's struggling and really wondering why they can't do anything right. And I understand your pain. So I didn't click this right, I guess. I thought I identified it correctly, but just double check whenever you do your, your history solid ID. Make sure this node is what you think it is. I thought this point was right here. And I mean, you can watch it back and look at it but sometimes pre post just freaks out and this is why you have to rerun simulations it's kind of a pain but so now we have both of these isolated and what we can do is we can look at the max principal strain first 
And then this is a case where the legend is useful because we see that this green one, B, this is 14956, and this is actually the one on the ball. I just remember on top of my head, so that makes sense because, like we said, the stress of the ball is going to be higher than the strength or than the stress of the block. But if we close that and we go to strain, and we do max principal strain, you can now see that the strain of the ball is practically zero, so it hits teeny tiny amount um, but and if you right click you'll reset like the zoom so if you do this you right click it resets it but the strain of the block is much higher so you actually get around 7% strain in the block during this first 10 seconds um, you can actually see just how much it strains in and out throughout the simulation so uh, this is how you can use EL out a lot of other times if you have like an impactor and a impacted surface you may have a like a, a beam behind that surface connected to like a rigid body and then you can actually get the stress and strain out of that beam using EL out. That's like a useful tactic. I may do that in the future but this is how you can use it in this case. I did want to make sure and mention that if you wanted to plot stress versus strain which is a pretty common you know thing for people to do <laughs> in, in engineering. Um, so I picked a one of these elements just in the middle of this block um, and what you want to do is just go to, you know, you can plot stress here and plot. And then you're going to do uh, save and you can go to curve. You can do curve or you can do a CSV. I usually just do, well, it's fine. You can do CSV just for the heck of it. And we can call this like random block element stress and hit save. And then what you're going to do is you're going to go here, switch this, switch this to strain, and then go down to max principal strain. You can, you know, it just depends what you want to do, but for now we're just going to look at max principal strain. You can look at effective strain if you want, whatever you want. Um, hit plot. And then you're going to do the same thing. Go to save, random block, strain, and then hit save. And you can click browse and actually like put it in a different place. It's going to default to the location where you opened the D3 plot though. So then you're going to hit close, close. You're going to go to XY plot. And then here, this is where it's going to change. You're going to go from show, click cross. And then X axis, you're going to do your strain. So you're going to click the strain here. So you can expand this if you want. And you're going to click this. And then you're going to click here. And it's going to put it here and then it's going to move to y axis so you're going to click stress and then you're going to click this and it's stress so now you're going to hit plot and what a beautiful plot look at that that's just so intuitive um <laughs> this is uh just showing you how to do it if you want um there's a lot going on, a lot of oscillating of this element. So there's a lot of this, which is why it looks like spaghetti. Um, but that's how you do it. And then you can go to sh uh, save again, and then you can save it out as stress verse. Oh, that's not stress. Stress verse strain, and then save. That's how you do that. I know people are going to ask, so there you go. So we'll move on to no doubt. So what we are focusing on here is different ways we can retrieve data um, using different nodes. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and click here and then click through all of these because theoretically they all should be very similar, but they're going to be all slightly different. And we're going to look at acceleration in the Z direction. So we're going to go to Z acceleration and we're going to hit plot. And what you can actually see is the interpolation did not work correctly. So um, this is D, this huge spike right here. Something happened and it kind of freaked out. Um, I don't know if we included a wrong node in the interpolation, but something weird happened. Um, and this would be cause for debugging. I may do it. Um, I don't know, but there you go. Welcome to the, the real world of modeling. 
Um, but if we kind of look at this past that, what you can also see if we zoom in at this 10 millisecond portion, so we can do like that. So the top one red, this is in the center of the ball. This is a node at the center of the ball on the mesh. There's this big spike right at the front, which is kind of interesting. Um, so I don't really know why that would be if it's in the center of the ball. I would think the bottom, so the, uh, yeah, oh, we didn't have one on the bottom. That's why. So, so the center of the ball is the lowest point that we actually had to the block. And that's why it had the, uh, this like kind of peak right here. We also have, oh, and you can also see this is pretty rough data. So our output was, I believe, 0.1. Um, this came out like this. So it was still pretty rough and increasing that to like 0 0.05 would have helped even more. Um, so in the future, you know, just keep that in mind. But getting back to here, so B is this green one. This is the top of the ball, so up here. And this is super noisy. Um, that makes sense because it's this furthest point from the impact and it's going to be wobbling the most as it goes. Even if it doesn't strain much like we saw, it's still going to be kind of oscillating. C um, was the side of the ball and it actually looks one of the best. So it's this, blue, this dark blue one, uh, which is interesting because it's on the side. And then the interpolation, even if it had this spike right at the beginning, it actually looks like it was the smoothest and I can isolate it if we click here and go to plot. Um, and it actually doesn't look too bad here. So if we wanted to do them all again though, plot, we can actually filter them. So we can go to filter and then you click your filter, SAE, one milliseconds. I'm gonna make this just like a thousand just to make it pretty conservative. And we're going to do this, zoom in. So it filtered a little bit. Um, these spikes have been kind of smoothed out. However, these oscillations are still here, so it's gonna take quite a bit of filtering to get rid of that. And a lot of times, too much filtering is going to really skew your data, so you wanna limit the amount of filtering. Yes, we jumped on the 600, and now these spikes are smoothed out, but you have these huge smoothed um, lines. So that would probably be too much for anything that you wanna like publish, just because you're kind of artificially altering your results. So what we can see here though is, um, especially if you have a deformable object, you want to use some type of interpolation. I know we had this issue in the front, um, but it's still, you know, I, I probably messed up. I don't know. I probably included a node that wasn't part of it or something happened, but this is the way that most people use um, kinematics for parts, especially deformable parts. If it's a rigid part, it doesn't really matter. You can just do output rigid bodies and then get the kinematics that way. So I do want to mention one thing regarding trajectories. So kinematics of the ball. There's one really cool thing you can do in Dyna, and it's called trace. Well, two things you can do. So you can use follow here in post, and you can follow a point. So you can actually follow like this point on the ball, hit apply. And what it's going to do is when you hit play, it's actually going to follow this object throughout the simulation. So that's pretty neat. Um, and that's really useful, especially if you're running like dynamic simulations and you want to see what's happening relative to what you're following. Another really cool thing you can do is trace. And if you have this active, you can just hit clear. It's going to get rid of that number. So if you go to trace, what you're able to do is select different points and it's gonna visually trace them throughout space. So I'm gonna open up this keyword file so I know which ones I need to trace. So we have history node ID. So this is the first one. And I'm just gonna use this to kind of show what they look like. Make sure your line color is gonna be different than white if your background's white or else you're not gonna be able to see it. So black, and I'm also gonna make the thickness thicker. And we're going to select this node. And we're going to do this one. And we're just going to select all these. All right, so now that you have all of the nodes selected, 
you can um, go here to write displacements is actually going to write out a defined curve. You don't really want to do that unless you want to. What you want to do is just play through it. Oh, I'm still following it. Oh boy. So I already selected all of these nodes and I want to be able to reload them easily because I'm about to close this to fix something. What you can do to just save these in a selection is you go to save to buffer and to buffer one and that can close it and reload um, them. But I want to go to follow and I want to get rid of this follow and hit clear and reset. So now it's been reset. So go back to trace and then we're going to go load and these four nodes and so starting state one and there we go so it's doing them white even though I said black huh there it goes now it's black so um, what this will do is it will just trace a line throughout space as you do the simulation which is pretty cool um, so we're going to animate. What's neat is you can actually look like between these different trajectories and see like how they differ. This is a one dimensional impact pretty much. It's only in the Z direction. So this top one and these two middle ones, the interpolation one and the one on the mesh are the exact same because they're all going in the Z direction. Um, but if this was more of an oblique impact where it like bounces, you'd really see kind of the differences in the trajectories. Um, but this is pretty cool to do in general for impacts. If you want any cool videos to like impress presentations, this is neat to do. Um, so if you want to try something else, you can go to clear and then you can click like a few of these nodes. And you can like kind of see the distribution of how this thing is moving. Um, it's pretty cool. Moving on, we have our section force, and we have the block load cell, which is down here, and the ball load cell. So what we can do with these load cells is actually look at force and moments. So we go down here to total force and hit plot. This actually came out really smooth, and this may be useful to compare to the RC force, which is the contact force between the ball and this block, or the block and the plate. So this is generally the best way to get smooth force data out of simulations. And there's not too many downsides. The only downside is you need like an actual section to cut through. This is useful if you have like an impacting plate below an object that you're hitting. You can actually do one of these sections of that plate. This only works though if the object is deformable. You can't use this with a rigid body because the rigid body is not going to deform. Hence, you're not going to get any force. You can get RC force, like contact force from a rigid body though. So um, what I'll do is I'll keep this open. And if we want to go to RC force and plot the force as well on the same plot, you just go over here to RC force and it didn't close it. It's still open. You can go ball to block and then you're going to go to resultant force and then P add over here and it's just going to add it to this plot. So interestingly, interestingly enough, it's not the same profile. So that's kind of interesting. Um, what I would assume is that since this section is in the middle of the block, it's not getting loaded until a little later when the ball is driving fur uh, through further and the contact force is happening right when the ball hits. So we can also look is the block to the ground and add that to here as well. And, um, it, it duplicated this, but it's okay. So this block to the ground is this teal one up here. And you see something kind of similar where it's a little more delayed, but it's even more loaded than the section force just because all that energy is driving through. But um, the point I want to make is you can see just how much more, um, how much more noise there is in the contact force versus the section force. This is also a little more complicated of a setup, whereas you have this, block that's getting compressed and hitting the ground. Um, if you asked me what I would plot in like a paper, I would have to really look into what we're trying to say, like what we're studying. If we're studying the effects of um, the ball hitting the block and compressing it, 
I would really focus on the SEC force probably, this red line. But if we're looking at like fracture of the top of the block, which doesn't make sense because it's rubber, but in an alternate universe, if we're looking at fracture there, I'd probably focus on a contact that's really between these two parts up here. And if we're looking at how the ground affects something, I'd be looking at this one. So just some context. Um, I hope that's useful. We can also look at the ball load cell here and hit plot. And this actually came out noisy. And this actually makes sense why it's noisy because this ball, well, actually, no. I don't know why it's so noisy because the ball is a lot stiffer than the block is. So um, it's just trial and error. I mean, if we go here to RC Force and do ball to block and we add it. And, oh, I didn't click this. We add. This is kind of similar. Granted, we're plotting total force and resultant force. So I'm actually not sure if these are the same in this case, because Dyna will do total, and I don't really know what it's doing. You have to kind of read through. So just to be sure that we're getting the right output for total force to make sure it's the same as resultant, what we can do is go to ball load cell, X force, hold control, Y force, hold control, Z force, plot, and then it's gonna open up, and you're gonna go to operation, and then to, not some, resultant three, and they're going to click this box, click the first one. It's going to automatically click this second box, and the second, and then the third. And it's going to give you um, these options. And you're just going to hit apply. And there's the resultant. So now that you have, have the resultant, what you have to do is go to save. And I believe you have to select this top one. See, it says total selected. And it's going to include them all in the top curve. So make sure that's selected. And go to save, output type, curve file, and just call this ball load cell manual resultant force. And save. And then what you can do is do the same thing with the RC, or no, go to section force, sorry, and just do total force plot and then save this as a curve as well. So auto and save. And then what you can do is close out of here, go to XY plot, and then you're gonna click here because it's gonna automatically have them from your kind of location. You're gonna hit, well, you're not gonna hit add, you're gonna hit here and then plot, and you're gonna click the next one here, P add. So, the resultant force was doing, or the total force is the resultant. They're just overlaid right on top of each other. Um, if you go here and you click on one and click off the other, um, it, they're both, they're just right over top of each other. That's that for this video. I just wanted to really go over how to set up these different types of outputs and what some of the differences between them are and you know what are good practices. Even if it doesn't work the first time, it's still useful doing it, figuring out how to get the best data out because it's best to get good data out before you have to filter because it's just the cleanest data, right? So uh, thanks for watching. I may do another video and do some varying parameters of this block and of the ball. And I may do some like oblique impacts and just show you some differences, but that may come a little later. So, um, but yeah, thanks for watching. Hope this was helpful and I'll see you in the next video.